And joining us now on the debate, former Ontario Premier Ernie Eves, now Executive Chairman of Jacob & Company Securities, Inc. Greg Cerbera, Liberal MPP for the riding of Vaughan. Former NDP advisor Robin Sears, now senior partner of the communications consulting firm Navigator. Sylvia Bashevkin, U of T political science professor and principal of University College. And Jim Coyle, Queen's Park columnist at the Toronto Star. Welcome everybody for what I think will be both a nostalgic look back and uh, just watching you watch that interview with David Peterson. I, anyway, we won't say anything, but Mr. Reeves had a great line. Let me just put it that way. <laughs> Let's start this. Can I ask our director, Michael Smith, to go to a wide shot here? Because I want to know who in this gathering thought David Peterson was going to be sworn in 25 years ago tomorrow. Who would believe that was going to happen? I did. Come on. No, I, I really did. You yeah, thought yeah. he was going to end the, the Tory yeah, dynasty. Yeah. What gave you that sense? Uh, well, uh, I remember having a conversation with him uh, uh, a few weeks after Mr. Davis announced that he was leaving. Uh, and I was talking with him about becoming a candidate. And he said... You know, Greg, I think if Davis were still there, we wouldn't have a chance, but I think with him gone, uh, we can do it. And then during the campaign, it was my first campaign, so many people said to me at the door, you know, with Mulroney in Ottawa now, maybe it's time for the Liberals at Queen's Park. And I heard it like for 37 days uh, during the, the election that ended on May the 2nd. And you were 39 years old and ended up in cabinet. Ah, uh, yes, that's what happened. <laughs> Robin, you had your hand up too. You really thought you had a shot? Sometimes parties make very improbable decisions about leaders. And when the Conservatives elected Frank Miller, I think many of us thought this is not going to fly. And you saw an opening there for the potential end of the dynasty. I didn't think it was likely the NDP were going to win, and therefore there was only one other option. <laughs> it turned out a little bit more complicated than I option. thought. <laughs> Ernie Eves, at 25 years ago, you were a rookie MPP. You'd waited about, I guess, what, three and a half, almost four years to get into cabinet. You got into cabinet for what, about five weeks? And <laughs> well, then I think it was about five months, wasn't it? Five but months? Anyway. Okay, five um, months. The, the reality is, uh, I think there's lots of reasons why that election went the way it did. I think that. Uh, we lost 18 seats. I think we probably lost about six of them uh, because of the education, the separate school funding issue. I think we probably lost six because we didn't run a very good campaign, to be quite frank. And I think we probably lost six because a lot of people were complacent. I'm talking about individual members, individual candidates. I remember talking to some of my colleagues, oh, well, I don't have to worry about that. We're going to win in a walk, blah, 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 blah. Hmm. And that sort of complacency builds up in governments. I mean, it's, it built up in in uh, Peterson's government, it certainly built up in Ray's government, it builds up in every government. It's the reality of politics, people get complacent. Sylvia, so having said that, that, I don't know if you meant to uh, put a pun there when you say, to be frank, we ran a lousy campaign, because <laughs> Frank Miller didn't run no, a great campaign. No, I don't campaign. think that uh, Frank could take all the hits for that. Um, you know, they ran the worst campaign probably they'd ever run, and they still won. They still won the most number of seats. Mm -hmm. So, a as bad as it was, there, there wasn't this, I mean, when the, when the electorate wants to get rid of you, they do what they did to the Conservatives federally in 1993, right? They leave them with two seats. So there wasn't this great hate in the land for the Tories, was no, it? No, was, it was a much more subtle uh, change, I think, which is why I thought that Miller would try and cobble things together and stumble on a bit longer. Um, I, I think it was about Ontario changing. I mean, I think David Peterson was right, that there was a sense, in particular, that the urban electorate uh, needed to see uh, something a bit different. Uh, I think under, uh, under Bill Davis, the Ontario Conservatives had more of a suburban legitimacy. After all, he was from Brampton, and he certainly was a very moderate progressive conservative, and I think he could, he could um, uh, speak to the multicultural diversity and the growth of social movements, including feminism, in a way that Frank Miller really couldn't. And I think the Liberals, in that sense, did have the momentum, and together with the NDP, I think they could bring together more Ontarians than Frank Miller could as leader of the Conservatives. You were on the bus then, Jim, right? I was. What'd you pick up? Well, I'll tell you, Steve, I've been doing this for 30 years. I've been to the Kyber Pass, the Taj Mahal, the Golden Temple. I even covered the Jamaican bobsledders and Eddie the Eagle. And nothing surprised me more than this election in 1995. <laughs> All you had to do was consult with Greg. It would yeah, have gone. Exactly. <laughs> you have to remember, even the Liberal Party that Peterson inherited when he won the leadership in 82, it was a very, it was a conservative rump from rural Ontario, more conservative than the PCs. And I think in 81, Sheila Copps was the only woman in the caucus. Uh, I remember in the 82 election, ask, she ran for leadership against David. 
I remember asking uh, one backbencher who he was supporting, and, and he told me, well, I'll tell you one thing, it ain't the broad. And that was sort of where the, uh, where the views of the caucus mm -hmm. were at that time. So he, he inherited a real uh, old-fashioned bunch. Uh, the period between 81 and 85, there were a lot of changes looking back now where you can sort of see that happening. And there's no question, the 85 campaign on the buses, Miller, Miller's was a disaster almost from start to finish. David had irreverence, energy, zip, all the things he spoke mm -hmm. about. And what happened to a lot of us, I think, is that we could sense something happening, but our brain wouldn't allow <laughs> us to believe what our gut was feeling, <laughs> partly because, you know, these guys had been empowered. Empow the joke was at the time that these guys had only been surpassed by Enver's Hawks on Alba in Albania. You know, that was the, long, the, old, the yeah. Albanian the charming old tyrant. was yeah, the so, only longer so, running. So you could see things happening, but in a way it was just too weird. I didn't think it would happen in my lifetime. Well, here's what happened. May 2nd, 1985. Roll tape. This is truly a magic moment. And it just proves what we liberals have been saying. Tonight there is a sunrise in Ontario. For everyone who exercised their democratic rights today of participating in the greatest expression of democracy, a thank you, a thank you. We all won something tonight. We won an opportunity, an opportunity to work together, to solve our pro problems in common. And I must say that I am very proud to have led the party who received the most votes in this election. Not the most seats, but Robin, the most votes. And I wonder how long before you and your fellow New Democrats started looking at those numbers and saying, you know, maybe we've got a chance to do something a little different here. Oh, 835 election night? <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, I, I think it was pretty fair the way David outlined the uh, circumstance in the opening interview. There were, there were basically only two options. We could go back to the 70s, Davis minority government style, or we could try and do something a little bit more solid. Some of us who've been through a few minority governments uh, were a little unhappy about the prospect of being put in a situation where six months after the plug could be pulled on some device that Greg dreamed up to make life difficult for New Democrats and have a snap election. So that was a pressure in one direction to, uh, to try and do a deal. There was a lot of pressure in the other direction, though, Stephen, and it's, it's very interesting to remember how far we've come. In 1980, I sat in Ed Broadbent's living room discussing Pierre Trudeau's offer of cabinet seats, and as party national director in that circumstance, I was horrified and said, this will split the party. The next year at the convention, Broadbent got roundly attacked for even thinking about it. We're only four years later. And Bob Ray's talking about the closest thing we've come to a peacetime coalition in Canadian politics. There was huge division in the party. And not to uh, flash forward too far, but things have changed a little bit since then. Yes, they have indeed. <laughs> uh, election night. Yeah. You, you come second, but you get the most number of votes. What's going through your head at that point? Do you think you're in opposition? Uh, well, I, I think all of us thought that uh, we were just uh, at uh, the threshold of dramatic change in Ontario. Uh, there was a sense, as Robin said, from 835 that things were going to change. The key was that, uh, as David mentioned in that clip, uh, we, run, we won the most number of votes. We had the highest uh, voter turnout. It was a signal that the people wanted a change. And all the rest of the stuff was uh, just a matter of working out the details. And it was historic. I mean, the Accord was a brilliant uh, symbol of a transformation of Ontario politics. Uh, it was well negotiated and it really worked. But even on election night, I think most of us thought that it wasn't going to be too long before we were going to be sworn in as the first Liberal government in 42 years. And what did you think election night? Only a Liberal could think that 48 was more than 52. <laughs> <laughs> well, but, but, but. And, and uh, 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 not, not to leave my NDP colleagues out, I found that out firsthand when I became Minister of Finance in 95. <laughs> However, having said all that. Um, well, hang on, you had more seats, but they got more votes. The Liberals got 38% yeah, well, uh, to Richard 37. Richard thinks they got more votes than John F. Kennedy, too. How would that work? Right, okay. Uh, you know, that happens from time to time in a first-past-the-post system. Um, I think the reality is that, uh, sure, there was this momentum. Obviously, it wasn't in favor of the Progressive Conservative Party of Ontario. Um, 
I thought, I still do think, quite frankly, the NDP did themselves a great personal disservice by signing the accord. I think, it just happens to be my opinion, they'd have been far better off to play a minority government the way it was normally played and to hold the government, whoever it happened to be, whether it was the Liberals or the, or the Conservatives, uh, to account day by day. I think they would have gained much more than that. Uh, and I think the proof of that was in the 87 election campaign. Uh, everybody got soundly trounced except for David Peterson. I think it was a brilliant uh, decision on the, on the Liberals' part to negotiate that accord. I don't think it was a brilliant decision on the NDP's part. Well, Steve, can I yeah, just yeah, talk yeah, here? Yeah. Something I think not many people know. The Tories actually did make an offer, and there were negotiations oh, yeah. with the Conservatives, oh, yeah. and they did try to offer something pretty close to an accord in those very tumultuous days. Oh, there were all kinds of discussions going on back mm -hmm. and forth. There's no doubt about that. But ultimately, you went with the, uh, you went with the Liberals. And, and I wonder, Sylvia, is he right, Ernie Eves? In, in effect, in 1987, people loved the Accord so much, they rewarded Peterson. They didn't reward Ray for it. They knocked him down a peg. Well, they did knock the NDP down a peg in 87. But again, not to fast forward too fast, but we know in 1990, the yep. fact that the NDP yep. won a majority helps, it seems to me, um, to be explained if we look back to the accord because people thought the NTP could be trusted to be near power and the fact that they won a majority in, uh, in 1990 obviously based on a minority of votes um, I think helped people become more comfortable with the idea that Ontario could be governed by an NDP um, you know uh, a leadership that had in fact worked very closely with the Liberals so in some respects it may have helped them what did you yeah, think, I, when think you I, I, I think that's absolutely right I think the accord was a stepping stone for Bob Ray and his party to government. It just took five years. Hmm. Did you see it that way? Absolutely. That 87 uh, election, you know, the Libyans got all the credit for all the activist things that had happened during the Accord years. And uh, David was hugely popular. I think I've never seen anything like it since uh, Trudeau in 68. He was the, the most popular During the 87 campaign, the it was like traveling with a rock star. You know, he'd have the sleeves rolled up, he'd have the tie loosened, uh, and he was, you know, middle-aged women were lining up to touch the hems of his... Uh, fashionable sleeves. It was really something to watch. So there was that huge, um, and that red tie became as big an icon mm -hmm. as, as Trudeau's uh, rose. 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 Mm -hmm. um, so there was that huge personal popularity. There was, a, there was a, an, an economy that had turned around. And uh, it was a late summer campaign. Everything was sunny. And uh, I remember going once from a, an NDP tour of a sewage plant <laughs> to a barbecue at Ridley with Jim Bradley and Peterson, and I thought, whoa. <laughs> you know, it's, it's a different thing. I than remember the, that. <laughs> <laughs> and it was, so, so that was, I, I, I think that was, uh, he wasn't sort of 93 seats popular, 95 seats popular, and there was a bit of an upward blip just based on, he had also had a huge honeymoon with the media. Right. I don't think we've ever been as slavish to anyone as we were to David you know, we like an underdog for starters during the campaign, and we were giddy at the change. And, you know, I, I'm embarrassed at some of the stuff we turned out in the aftermath. I, I, you know, Mr. Eze, I'd be interested in your take on that, because I remember it well, too. And, and the notion that, you know, this dynasty could come to an end is a pretty good story if you're a reporter. Did you find that the media was out to get you guys in that campaign, gave Frank Miller a heck of a hard time? Oh, I don't think there's much doubt about it. I think the media generally is tougher on the government in power than they are in opposition parties. I just think that's, uh, that's the way of the world. That's part of our political system. It's the way it operates. And you can whine about it if you want, if your government doesn't do you much good. I, I don't think there's any doubt that they were more uh, critical, obviously. Mm -hmm. uh, I think people do like an underdog, whether you're talking about sports, politics, life, whatever. So I think that, uh, you know, that was certainly a part of it as well. I go back to the 85, 87 thing, though. I couldn't disagree more, obviously. I mean, people don't. Uh, give David Peterson the number of seats he got in 87 because they think they're going to vote for Bob Ray in 1990 if Peterson happens to screw up. I don't think that thought even entered their mind. And um, I know Bob Ray quite well. I play golf with him three or four times a year. He will tell you he was the most surprised person of any to win a majority government in 1990. In fact, I remember him telling me once that 48 hours before Election Day, they had no clue that they were going to win a majority government. They thought they might have a chance of winning a minority government. And I think that the Robin would know far more about that than I would in the back rooms of the but, NDP. But Ernie, I do think that Greg's point is, is sound from this perspective. If I think back to the polling data and the focus groups we were doing in that period, let's say between 86 and 88, crossing over the 87 campaign, 
the negatives about the NDP on economic management fell consistently through that period among swing voters. So I don't think it's contestable that the accord had a positive impact on the perception of the party, and particularly Bob as a leader, as someone, as Sylvia put it, that one could trust with, with government. Some would argue that was a misperception, uh, but I, I think there was no doubt that being that close to government and being associated with governmental change that people supported had a positive impact on the perception of the party. Yeah, that's, ab uh, that's absolutely right. I mean, uh, uh, Stephen Lewis uh, gave the NDP a certain kind of credibility uh, as, an in, uh, as an opposition party. As an opposition party. But, uh, uh, and, uh, you know, Bob and the NDP and the Tories, everyone did badly in 1987 because of the success uh, and the momentum that David gave to the 85 87 period in government. We were as active as any government had been in years in Ontario. And it wasn't just separate school funding. Uh, it was the Spills Bill. It was Freedom of Information. Uh, it was pay equity. I mean, it was just uh, a, an agenda that was chock full, and we were rewarded in 87 for that agenda. However, uh, Bob Ray never lost his credibility, and when we fell out of favor for a brief for 37 days, and that was all it was, we went into that election with 50% support mm -hmm. at the polls. When we fell out of favor, people said, well, you know what? This guy, Ray, is reliable, and we can vote for him uh, without risking the future of the province. And that's how they came to power. Let's just put these numbers up, Michael, just to remind everybody what it was. Again, the 1985 Ontario election results, PCs 52 seats, Liberals 48, NDP 25. After two years of the accord, two short years later, Look what happened. The Liberals had 95 out of 130 seats. The NDP moved into opposition as the official opposition. Only 19 seats, however. The PC's down at 16. And, you know, talk to us, Sylvia, about those two years that were sort of the Liberals were the government, but supported by the NDP every mm -hmm. step, of, most steps of the way. Uh, how would you regard those two years in terms of the kind of government that was offered to the people of Ontario? Well, I think David Peterson was accurate. I mean, I think it was exceptionally activist. It was certainly a chance where we saw ministers who looked very different from the ministers in the previous conservative governments. We saw Alvin Curling. We saw first Chaviva, black minister. First, we saw Chaviva Hoshek. People had different kinds of names. They had different appearances. So I think the Peterson uh, government and, and caucus looked very different from what people had visually um, seen. And we had television in uh, the legislature over time so we could actually see what the ledger looked like. Looked more like the people. Um, we saw uh, an agenda and I think people like the idea that the Accord set out an agenda and this a group of Liberals and New Democrats actually worked together and, and brought it into effect. Uh, women voters were crucial certainly to that shift to the Liberals. And I think pay equity was very important. It was the, uh, a chance in Ontario to actually say that equal pay for work of equal value was something a, a provincial government was going to pursue. And it was important because 90% of workers in, in Canada are actually governed by provincial statute Jim, in terms of well, labor law. Yeah, sorry, the accord years? Sorry. Funnily enough, that, uh, that had been kind of a flag to the Tories as long ago as 81. I remember a, a policy conference in London that Alan Gregg uh, was the chief presenter at. And he had hair down to his shoulders in those days and an earring, and we had never seen a Tory looking like this. But, <laughs> but he was their pollster and demographer, and he came and, and advised uh, uh, a moderate course because he's talked about the rise of women in the workplace, the immigration, um, at youth, the baby boomers had come of age, and how things were changing. And it's, it's one of the interesting things in 85 to me that beer and wine in the corner store mm. was such a, it was a symbol of uh, opening things up. Just remind everybody what that promise was. Well, the, see, the promise was to, to loosen the monopoly of uh, the LCBO and what was known, it wasn't even known as the beer store in those it was days. It was brewers retail. Brewers, mm -hmm. uh, and allow corner stores to sell uh, some wines and beer and uh, possibly liquor. I can't quite remember the details. We still, 25 years later, we still don't have it. <laughs> but it, it was the symbol of uh, throwing off some of those shackles of old Orange, Orange Ontario, appealing to maybe ethnics or, or Europeans who'd grown up with this in their culture, uh, certainly to young people. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, it, Greg had uh, sort of mentioned this in 81, and then when uh, Davis quit at Thanksgiving 84 and Miller took over, it sort of was the, they veered away from that mm -hmm. entirely, mm -hmm. but it, it wasn't as though they hadn't been warned. <laughs> Let me get you, Greg, yeah. to compare the, the, uh, the two years of 85 to 87, as you say, very activist government, an accord with ideas yeah. and agenda for change. You win this huge, massive majority in 1987, and then the next three years are quite different. What yeah, was the biggest difference governing with so many MPPs versus so few? Uh, well, I think, uh, f uh, firstly, uh, we had, 
we, we had just won everything, and the caucus was, if anything, too large. There were some management problems right inside. Actually, Haviva Hoshek was part of that caucus. Uh, uh, she made her appearance in 1987. Uh, and the agenda for uh, the country uh, and the province changed dramatically. Uh, all of the issues that we talked about, pay equity, these were all provincial issues, beer and wine in the corner grocery store. Suddenly, we were talking about national unity. Suddenly, we were talking about free trade. And, uh, the, and the national issues just kind of overshadowed everything uh, that, uh, uh, that we were doing. I, I remember a discussion uh, uh, on a side table in cabinet when uh, the big issue was auto insurance. And uh, our premiers uh, uh, quipped to a couple of us, I didn't get elected to deal with them auto insurance. And the fact is that Auto insurance is a big issue provincially. He had become very, very uh, wrapped in those big national issues. We were on the losing side on free trade. We had been against the free trade agreement. It ultimately was put in place and it ultimately served the country and the province very well. Let me ask Ernie Eves about this. You're one of 24 people who've had that top job in cabinet. Is there a temptation to kind of not stick to the parochial provincial issues and you see that national unity stuff which is you know, they're going to write about that in the history books. They don't necessarily write about changing auto insurance policy. Is it, is it tempting to get I don't think you think it, of it that way. Yeah. But there's no doubt that, uh, for example, the difference between being premier and finance minister is like night and day. As finance minister, you really know the details of every single policy of government. You have to. I mean, you know every single policy and every single minister. Uh, as premier, you're looking at a very much higher level, broad-based, general approach as opposed to specific approach about specific issues and specific things. I don't think you'd think of it, quite frankly, I don't think David thought of it as, gee, I'm going to be important if I get written up in the history books as helping solve this I problem. Think right, yeah. I think he generally was, was concerned about what happened to the future of the country. Yeah. However, I don't think that's why they lost the election. To I, be, uh, I Go mean, ahead, Robin. I, mean, I think they lost yeah. because they got a little um, too self-important and uh, I think they took the public for granted when they called an early election. I don't think the public liked that. Go ahead, Rob. I mean, Canadian history demonstrates one thing very, very clearly. It's hard to defeat a first-term government. It's very hard to elect a second-term government to a third term. And it's one not going to be all that hard. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to make that point right now. It's more difficult than you think. There are, <laughs> there are exceptions, but they are very yes, few. Are. <laughs> Secondly, you. And Ernie alluded to this earlier, let me put a harsher term on it. He said second majority governments and, and I would argue second term majority governments get complacent, they get arrogant. I mean everybody is human in power and power corrupts and you get complacent, yes, but the face to the public is one of arrogance. The 87 to 90 period for the Peterson era, I'm afraid, was night and day from the perspective of a responsive, listening, caring government to a big spending, arrogant, driving their partisan message government. And I think there's a lot of mists of history challenge we have here looking back 25 years. We were all a hell of a lot younger. <laughs> the, the accord period was not all sweetness and light between no, the Liberals not. and the NDP. It was a ferociously competitive process. One of the heroes of that uh, era that doesn't get enough credit is Bob Nixon who presided over monthly drunken evenings where he bashed the senior ministers and staff's heads together, who were propens whose propensity was to fight and squabble in public at great length. Um, when it came to 87, the discipline of the accord was removed from each side. Hmm. So the NDP could behave, frankly, more irresponsibly in opposition, yeah. and the Liberals could behave more arrogantly, unfettered by this leash that they had had to suffer previously. But Jim, you know what, one of the things David Peterson said um, before, as he was getting his makeup on, he said, I, I still haven't figured out where that line between showing leadership and being arrogant is. If they like you, they call it leadership. If they don't like you, they say you're arrogant. Is that a fair comment? <laughs> it is, That's but uh, David put his finger on something, I think, inadvertently that did him in. He talked about replacing a government of old white guys, uh, making all the decisions, smoking pipes behind closed doors at the Albany Club. Well, you don't have to change too many of those words to describe the process that happened at Meech Lake. You know, it was a bunch of old white guys clocking themselves up in one of the most preposterous shows I've ever seen in Ottawa for a week and making uh, huge decisions because they knew what was good for the country and the country plainly resisted it and David was one of the, the faces of this you know he was Captain Canada he tossed a few Senate seats into the into the mix and people uh, as the Charlottetown uh, a referendum later showed um, 
they resented it. They resented it, it resented it deeply. And all you have to do is look at some of the photos to know that David photographs smugly. There's mm -hmm. no one who has a more smug smile, a, a cat, a the canary beautiful. feathers, than anyone. <laughs> and that became, I think, the abiding problem for him. And the, the sense also that he was sneaking out ahead of the economic train wreck and pulling the plug early seems so calculating and cynical. Well, let's remind everybody about that, because obviously mm -hmm. governments are elected for four or five years. We didn't have fixed election dates mm -hmm. back then. He went after three, and he said he needed a strong hand to deal with what was coming. You know, a lot of people saw, you got 95 seats already. How much stronger what, do you need? Well, what more do you need in the middle of a summer? I remember the uh, phone-in shows that summer mm. when people were just remarkably angry about being distracted from their ability to enjoy the summer by a government that had many, many seats. It wasn't as if he had a precarious government. He, in fact, had too much mischief in that caucus. There was the appearance of dirty hands, the scandals that affected uh, the liberals, the Patty Starr scandal and so on in that period between uh, uh, the... Uh, Late 80s. You know, uh, 87 and 90. Um, and so I don't think that helped the liberals. And it wasn't clear to most voters who would call into those shows exactly why he needed this, mm -hmm. this election. Mm -hmm. It wasn't that clear. And of course, he was dogged by, by protesters. The fact that Greenpeace interrupted his, his um, calling of the election mm -hmm. reminded people that the environment was still a problem, mm -hmm. that housing in Toronto, particularly affordable housing, was still a problem. Mm -hmm. That many of the activist expectations that people had from the Accord period from 1985 mm -hmm. had not been fulfilled. I'm and that ask, was a bad reminder. I'm going to ask Greg Cerbera to violate cabinet solidarity right now. Uh oh. Okay. Uh, <laughs> take, take us in the room in the summer of 1990 and the Premier is going around his cabinet table saying, I want to call it an early election. What do you think? Who was the last holdout to that? Greg. I think I was. <laughs> I think you were. Yeah, I was. Uh, uh, I just uh, uh, worried that a number of things were conspiring against us. Uh, we were still very popular in the polls. Uh, we went in, I think, at 50%. But all of these uh, smaller things uh, seemed to conspire together. And my sense is the, the mood out there uh, would become very angry if one of those things got out of hand. And I think what it was was, the hell are you calling this election for? Mm -hmm. We were interfering uh, with uh, the summertime that people thought they had a right to enjoy. Mm -hmm. uh, so I just had, I, I, I had a very ominous feeling. I didn't think we would, li we would lose. Mm -hmm. But I thought that, uh, you know, we had 94 seats uh, and the speaker, and that a lot of our members wouldn't be coming back uh, and that would uh, hurt us very badly. Having said that, Mr. Eves, the conventional wisdom at the time was there's a recession coming. Mike Harris has been on the job as the new PC leader for a month. No one's going to vote for the NDP in government. We know that. That'll never happen. So if you look at the strategic decision to be made, it didn't seem like a dumb idea to go early. Would you agree? Well, I think it was a very, you can call it practical, you can call it crass political decision. There's no doubt about it. I think they thought that if we go into a recession, and the elections held a year from now or 18 months from now, we're probably going to lose because of the recession. Uh, you're quite right. Mike Harris has just been elected, so they don't have time to organize. You know, the NDP isn't probably going to win, so why not go for it? And I think that basically, in a nutshell, Greg would know better than I, was the, was the rationale behind it. Uh, obviously, it didn't work out too well. Uh, you know, all that would that we all had great hindsight in uh, in life and in politics, but uh, that influenced you though. Going, I, I, my recollection is going early. David Peterson's going early was a cautionary tale for you not to go early when you were premier. I w I did not go early because I I firmly believe in parliamentary tradition, and uh, four years. I mean, I had people arguing the other way. Well, why don't you hold on to five years and uh, you know maybe things will turn around. Da 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 da. Uh, you talk about being ahead when you go into the election. Uh, Miller was way ahead. He was 20 points ahead when yeah, you went yeah. in. And I was one of the few people, quite frankly, that sat around that table and said, don't do it. Mm. Um, I said, my writing's right next to yours, Frank. And people in my writing don't necessarily know who you are. So mm. the people in Ontario certainly don't know you as premier. They don't really know who you are. There's no big rush to rush into this. Uh, but, you know, he followed his gut and he did what he wanted to do, and so did David. David well, did what he wanted. Robin, as you look at the political calculation that David Peterson had to make, I mean, everything did line up to an early election. It didn't seem like a dumb idea at the time, is what I'm trying to say. Would you agree? I mean, it didn't work out, but it didn't seem like a dumb idea at the time. It didn't seem like a dumb idea at the time in the bubble of Queen's Park. 
and among those smarty pants people like all of the <laughs> folks around this table <laughs> live within it. But I think Sylvia's <laughs> point is, is the germane one here. There are two other verities about Canadian politics, I believe. One is you can never appear to be putting partisan interest ahead of the responsibility to govern in the eyes of voters, and it's particularly true in Ontario. They, Bill Davis used to have a great line which was, when you're on the front page of the Globe and Mail as the governor, government of Ontario, you're losing. People want you to govern quietly and competently, and if you put partisan agendas first, you're probably going to get clobbered. I would argue it happened to the Harris government. Uh, ultimately, it probably happened to, to Bob Ray's government. The second thing is, I think, you need a reason. You know, you need a message, particularly if you're appearing to put partisan interest first. What, does anybody remember what the Liberals' message was in 1990? There's a wonderful story. Uh, after the election was called, Ian Scott, the Attorney General, and Ian Scott uh, made a, a big media announcement about uh, if we're re-elected, re we're going to be bringing in legislation relating to boating and drinking. <laughs> And Bob Ray, to his credit, stood in front of a pile of microphones and said, for this, we are having an election. And that message got through. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and people got angry at David Peterson for a short while. Uh, the people supported him and his government to his credit, because I think he uh, served, uh, had a magnificent five years in government. But the level of anger... I don't think has ever been replicated in Ontario politics. Well, Ian Scott, five years later. Yeah. <laughs> Ian Scott said to me, three, three days after that election was called, Ian Scott said to me, yeah, they're angry today, they'll be angry for a few days, but what are they going to do, vote for the NDP? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Apparently the answer was yes. Uh, okay, last few minutes here. Jim, uh, tackle this one here. Uh, five years. Peterson was in for five years. A lot of people thought it would be longer, turned out to just be five years. What's different about Ontario thanks to those five years that the Liberals were in power? Well, I think Queen's Park, when I arrived there, used to be like the Sleepy Hollow of Confederation. You know, it was a, a bunch of old white guys managing the small things and the, over a general prosperity. Uh, this threw the doors off completely. And I would say from 85, the next 15 years were probably the most tumultuous and fascinating uh, political period in this province, maybe in the country. You know, we were on the front lines. It was the most interesting national story. I, Remember, I was working for the Ottawa Citizen at the time, and I, they were moving uh, our columns on the Southern Wire because, for once, Ontario mm. politics was interesting, interesting elsewhere it's in the country. And you got, you know, that, that it, it threw off the shackles that anything was possible. You know, the, an NDP government, a reformist, reform party like government mm -hmm. under, under Mike, you know, it was the most, Mike Harris, it was a fascinating, turbulent uh, ride for 15 years. I think that's. What do you say, Sylvia? I think it brought alive democracy in Ontario. I can say, as someone who was teaching introductory Canadian politics, it suddenly became a subject that students wanted to examine because we'd gone from the uh, Albania-like 42 years of one party in power to this um, accord to a liberal majority, to an NDP majority, to a you know, very right of center uh, conservative government. I mean, it, it did make it seem as if we actually had a multi-party democracy, and that's important. So the message, Greg, is make sure that there's no more dynasties to and out, right? That's got to be the idea. <laughs> two elections and out. Uh, no, I don't think so. The uh, but you know, yeah, yeah. the fact is that uh, when, I, when, I, when one party's in power for 42 years, those roots go down very, very deep. Uh, and the fact is that uh, that's why we didn't quite make it in 1985, because those roots held that tree up uh, for a little while longer. But I think we all agree. Uh, that election changed Ontario politics forever and for the better. Steve, can I just make one additional speculation? Seconds. What would have happened if there had been a coalition in 85? Would Mr. Peterson have been Premier for more than five years? What do you think? Yes. He would have been. <laughs> I think the discipline of that relationship would have served those two parties and the province well. And would Bob Ray still be a New Democrat today as a result? <laughs> That's another question for another or show. Or Prime Minister of the country. The or Prime Minister of the country, who knows? And let me thank everybody for coming in for a, a, a wonderful discussion about 25 years ago. Greg Sorbera, the Liberal for uh, Vaughan. Ernie Eves, former Premier of Ontario. Robin Sears, the former NDP advisor. Jim Coyle from the Toronto Star. Love reading your stuff, Jim. It's always great. Sylvia Bashevkin from the University of Toronto. Thanks so much, everybody. Thanks. Thank you.